Euh, écoutez, euh, les premiers mots, ben, c'est pour euh, souhaiter la bienvenue. Bon matin à tous. Pour commencer, euh, euh, bon matin. Euh, bienvenue à tous et euh, euh, merci, de, merci, euh, merci de votre présence. Merci d'être à Saint-Sauveur. Euh, beaucoup d'entre vous, c'est euh, la première visite à Saint-Sauveur. Vous m'entendez bien en arrière? Oui. Euh, beaucoup d'entre vous, c'est votre première visite à Saint-Sauveur. Donc, euh, euh, merci, merci d'avoir, euh, merci aux organisateurs, au comité organisateur d'avoir choisi Saint-Sauveur pour sa neuvième conférence euh, Forum mondial de médiation. Euh, merci, euh, merci. On est Saint-Sauveur est, euh, est honoré, privilégié euh, de, 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 de vous accueillir, d'autant plus que c'est une première, je crois, en Amérique du Nord euh, de, de, de faire ou de, de, de compléter ou de faire ce, ce congrès-là. Euh, on est privilégié de vous avoir ici. Bienvenue à tous. Merci. Euh, vous allez découvrir, euh, ceux qui ne connaissent pas Saint-Sauveur, vous allez découvrir un site euh, pittoresque. Euh, C'est une petite ville de 10 300 habitants. Euh, ça, c'est à la résidence permanente. Vous avez euh, euh, 5 000 euh, résidences euh, euh, temporaires ou des gens qui sont à deuxième, leur deuxième résidence qui sont installés ici en plus des, des, vigilatures, des, des vigilateurs qui viennent régulièrement. Donc, euh, en haute saison, euh, il y a peut-être 20-25 000 habitants qui vivent à Saint-Sauveur. Donc, c'est un défi, c'est un défi pour nous euh, de les accueillir, c'est un défi pour nous de, de les, euh, les, les accueillir et les, euh, les, les, les animer, euh, parce que ça demande une animation, ces, ces gens-là qui viennent ici. Les, les résidents, les 10 300 habitants, s'attendent de, de semaine en semaine. Pour ceux qui connaissent un petit peu euh, Saint-Sauveur et sa dynamique, mais à toutes les, les fins de semaine, durant l'été, euh, euh, je parle durant l'été, c'est avec de commencer jusqu'à à, à fin d'octobre, il y a de l'animation toutes les fins de semaine euh, dans le cœur du village, des, des spectacles, euh, il y a des... Euh, il y a des, euh, des, des fêtes, c'est festif, Saint-Sauveur en été, c'est... Euh, c'est assez intéressant. On a des, des, des fêtes un petit peu internationales dans le cadre du village qui attire, je prends par exemple la fête cubaine qui a lieu la fin de semaine de la fête du, de la fête du travail pour trois jours. Euh, il y a peut-être une centaine de cent, cent mille personnes qui viennent, qui passent les trois jours ici. Donc, euh, on voit que c'est couru, c'est animé. Euh, on a des festivals internationaux qui sont ici euh, tous les années, le Festival euh, des Arts de Saint-Sauveur qui est un un des plus, plus importants festivals de danse au monde euh, qui a lieu ici fin juillet, début août. Donc, euh, ceux qui demeurent euh, à proximité, Montréal, euh, n'hésitez pas à venir faire un tour à Saint-Sauveur cet été. Puis même ceux qui restent loin, là, je pense que ça vaut le déplacement. Il euh, n'y euh, a pas toujours des réparations, puis ce n'est pas toujours à Bourbé comme ça l'est là. Euh, C'est sûr qu'il euh, y a des défis euh, à Saint-Sauveur, vous allez voir, il y a des des boutiques, des petites boutiques, des restos, des, des sites pittoresques. Euh, vous allez découvrir en marchant cette, cette semaine-ci, si vous avez la chance de le faire, euh, euh, il y a des travaux importants. Sur la rue principale, il y a des travaux importants, donc ça peut perturber un petit peu. Euh, puis ces travaux-là, ça m'amène euh, à parler un petit peu de, de médiation. Il y a de la médiation partout, hein, puis euh, j'ai parcouru un petit peu votre site, puis j'ai dit « Mon Dieu, que ça… ça » Ça pourrait s'appliquer à, à, à n'importe qui, puis même en euh, ville de Saint-Sauveur, on, on fait de la médiation. Lorsqu'on a, on a décidé de faire ces travaux-là, on a voulu, euh, a voulu euh, être transparent. Vous avez les commerçants, vous avez les résidents, donc on a, on a fait de la médiation avec ces gens-là. On sait, euh, puis la médiation, euh, euh, moi, la médiation que j'aime faire, c'est d'être franc, euh, ne rien cacher, et d'être transparent. Je pense c'est euh, c'est en tout cas c'est ma façon de d'arriver de, 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 de trouver des solutions euh, euh, parce que je gardais votre euh, votre votre mission la mission c'est le développement et l'échange de connaissances d'informations de compétences dans tous les secteurs d'activité donc ça nous ressemble on en fait à tous les jours de la médiation euh, on en fait en équipe en équipe euh, notre conseil municipal on fait de la médiation on en fait avec les citoyens on en fait avec les les commerçants, euh, c'est continuel. Ça a une relation directe avec nos grands défis aussi. Pour les réaliser, ces grands défis-là, puis je vais en parler un petit peu tantôt, des grands défis, pour les réaliser, les grands défis, ça, ça nous prend de la médiation parce que ici, il y a trois groupes, là, je sépare en trois, il y a les, les commerçants, les résidents et les visiteurs. Et euh, ces trois groupes de personnes-là, 
lorsque ça se retrouve tous à saint ouvert ça fait du monde, ça fait, puis chacun a des intérêts différents, donc il euh, euh, faut trouver des points communs puis essayer de satisfaire tout le monde. C'est ça, en fait, qui, qui est le grand défi des, de, 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 de mon travail là, comme, comme maire, c'est de satisfaire, puis avancer, puis rendre cette, cette ville-là, euh, n'a pas, pas la sortie de ses origines, finalement. Euh, les, le, le grand défi qu'on a actuellement à Saint-Sauveur, c'est que cette ville-là euh, conserve son côté pittoresque. Euh, vous, allez, vous allez voir en marchant, il y a des, 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 des petites maisons, c'est un, un vieux village, Saint-Sauveur, puis euh, le défi, le, les gens qui viennent ici, puis les gens qui marchent dans les rues ici, ils veulent retrouver ce côté pittoresque-là. Ce n'est pas d'en faire une ville moderne, ce n'est pas pour ça qu'ils aiment Saint-Sauveur, c'est pour d'autres choses, c'est pour retrouver euh, le calme, la nature, le plein air, euh, aller faire du vélo dans les sentiers, faire du ski de fond, etc. Euh, L'autre euh, grand défi, c'est de euh, préserver l'aspect bucolique de nos espaces. Euh, il y a des, 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 des petits lacs, chalets, maisons, euh, les, les, les maisons de, de, des deuxièmes résidences. Donc, ces gens-là qui viennent ici, c'est pour euh, trouver ça. Euh, notre, euh, notre but, c'est surveiller la construction dans le cœur du village et dans le secteur boisé, conserver nos secteurs boisés. Être à l'écoute de nos citoyens et économiquement euh, maintenir un bas taux de taxation. Comme euh, que, si vous fouillez un peu sur le site, vous allez voir que le taux de taxation est très, très bas. Donc, euh, on parle de défis, médiation, réussite. Euh, puis, je, je, je vais terminer là-dessus. Euh, J'aime toujours ça voir des, des citations d'hommes politiques ou de, 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 des gens qui ont marqué leur, leur histoire. Puis, j'estime que cette citation-là d'Henry Ford, ça date de près de 100 ans, est toujours très réaliste, puis ça s'applique à notre mission, puis à votre mission également, qui, qui se dit comme suit, « Se réunir est un début, rester ensemble est un progrès, et travailler ensemble est la réussite. » Donc, je vous souhaite une réussite, je me la souhaite, je vous la souhaite, je souhaite un bon congrès, passez une belle semaine. Merci, M. le maire. J'inviterai maintenant Mme Mylène Jacou, présidente du comité organisateur, à prendre la parole. <rire> Je pense qu'on ne me voit pas, hein? <rire> bon, alors bonjour. Euh, bienvenue au, au forum. Là, je vais essayer de me lever un peu, mais c'est casse-gueule. Bon, alors bonjour, bienvenue. Je vais être très rapide parce qu'on a pris un peu de, de retard, mais euh, je vais... Euh, rapidement vous, vous dire quelle est l'essence le, même de ce, ce forum et cette neuvième conférence. On a voulu, et vous, a, vous pouvez le voir dans le, le programme, euh, poursuivre la mission en fait du Forum mondial de médiation qui est fondé sur l'interdisciplinarité. Donc vous, a, vous pouvez voir dans le programme qu'on a un programme euh, euh, très diversifié, fondé sur... Euh, euh, une, espèce, une espèce de convergence de toutes ces euh, médiations qui, euh, dans le cadre interpersonnel, on sait, elles sont souvent très euh, sectorisées. Donc, on a voulu poursuivre euh, cette tradition du Forum mondial de médiation avec, et je vais insister, une première, c'est que euh, c'est la première fois dans l'histoire du Forum mondial de médiation que on, euh, on organise une rencontre avec les médiations internationales. Nos représentants sont, sont là et moi j'en suis euh, vraiment euh, ravie, donc d'où le titre euh, de cette conférence, euh, Regards croisés sur les médiations internationales et les médiations interpersonnelles. C'est l'inverse, mais ce n'est pas grave. Euh, donc euh, voilà, c'est une, une belle occasion. Euh, vous allez voir la trame de ce contenu-là euh, vise aussi à essayer de voir comment cette approche de médiation, qui est une approche euh, finalement transversale euh, par sa méthode, elle peut euh, se distinguer ou au contraire se ressembler selon ces deux grands champs de la médiation internationale et interpersonnelle. Et euh, voilà, c'est une occasion unique, ce n'est pas, euh, pas évident de réunir toutes ces personnes qui travaillent euh, souvent euh, en vase clos, donc on, on a des fois des... Des, des, des colloques sur de la médiation pénale, sur la médiation familiale, mais je, je pense que c'est une belle occasion de, de se réunir tous euh, 
euh, autour de cette méthode transversale, mais où les occasions de rencontres sont, sont rarissimes. Alors, c'est une belle, une belle occasion. Rapidement, euh, vous avez pu voir qu'on a voulu euh, regrouper à travers les plénières, mais aussi les ateliers, finalement, les grandes questions hein, qui touchent la, la médiation, donc euh, euh, de voir les, les principaux enjeux autour de la place, la portée, l'effectivité des, des médiations. Euh, et euh, c'est vrai que moi, j'y tenais particulièrement euh, de donner une place particulière à, à, à la question de la réconciliation et des peuples autochtones. Donc, ceux qui ne viennent pas euh, du Québec euh, et du Canada savent que nous avons euh, une population autochtone, des peuples autochtones, et euh, la question nous apparaissait pour le comité organisateur importante à inclure. Euh, J'ajouterai aussi une autre première, le maire l'a souligné, c'est vrai que c'est la première fois que le forum, la conférence du Forum mondial se réunit euh, en Amérique du Nord et ça on est bien, bien heureux de ça parce que les autres euh, rencontres c'était euh, à Cuba, c'est vrai qu'il fait plus chaud là, mais euh, Cuba, le Venezuela, il y a eu l'Espagne, il y a eu Israël, etc. Bref, c'est la première fois qu'on qu aille cette neuvième, enfin, cette conférence euh, en Amérique du Nord et on est euh, vraiment très content. Je soulignerai aussi une autre première parce que euh, moi, ça fait longtemps que j'ai une curiosité par rapport à un, une approche de médiation qu'on appelle la, la médiation narrative. Euh, qui est euh, ici euh, assez méconnu et ça aussi c'est une première on a la chance d'avoir vendredi euh, deux ateliers de formation le matin et l'après-midi par Gérald Monk qui est l'initiateur de euh, cette, cette approche narrative qui est euh, comme vous le savez peut-être l'approche euh, de médiation le style de médiation le, le plus sociologique de, de toutes les approches donc ça je pense que ça va être très intéressant euh, je termine en vous disant qu'on a quand même un, un bon programme. Il y a plus de 200 participants, euh, 27 ateliers, 86 communications, euh, 18 pays représentés avec presque les quatre coins du monde. Euh, on a l'Afrique, le Rwanda, donc je suis très heureuse d'accueillir une représentante du Rwanda avec un projet super intéressant d'ailleurs, je fais de la pub. Euh, il y a un représentant du Sénégal, il y a l'Océanie, la Nouvelle-Calédonie, l'Europe est fortement représentée, je ne vous dis pas tous les pays, mais très, très euh, représentée. Et nous avons une forte représentation de l'Amérique latine. Alors je souhaite la bienvenue à toutes ces personnes qui se sont déplacées pour venir ici. Et je termine évidemment euh, cet événement-là. Euh, on espère que tout se passera bien malgré le, le retard de ce matin. Mais j'aimerais vraiment remercier très chaleureusement les deux co-organisateurs euh, qui ont permis euh, ce, cet événement-là. Donc c'est l'Université du Luxembourg avec Claude Doucement et euh, le Centre de recherche en droit public de l'Université de Montréal. Euh, vous avez dans vos pochettes la liste de tous les soutiens qui euh, ont permis financièrement de soutenir cet événement-là. Alors, je n'ai pas le temps de les nommer, mais on tenait vraiment à ce qu'ils soient bien visibles dans la pochette. Et je remercie évidemment le comité organisateur. J'espère qu'ils ne sont pas euh, trop dispersés, mais je voulais vous les présenter. Euh, donc, je remercie spécialement euh, Pascal Neumann, qui est la coordonnatrice, mais qui a l'air d'avoir disparu. <rire> euh, ah voilà, Pascal, voilà. Merci, Pascal, pour euh, le travail accompli. Euh, Marie-Claude Barbeau-le-Duc, qui est à la réception. Il y a Nathalie Croteau, de l'IMAC, l'Institut de médiation et d'arbitrage du Québec. Euh, Claude Ousman, professeur à l'Université du Luxembourg. Isabelle Tardif de l'Association des organismes de justice alternative du Québec. Marie-Joëlle Zahar, professeure à l'Université de Montréal. Et je remercie aussi nos deux bénévoles qui sont étudiantes en criminologie, Frédéric Routier, euh, Marion de la Bruyère, qui vous ont accueilli. Et je remercie aussi euh, très chaleureusement Denise Caron, qui a accepté de euh, nous aider pour, euh, pour cette conférence et de nous accompagner. Alors voilà, merci et bon colloque à tous. Merci, Madame Jacou. J'invite M. Jacques Ousman, 
professeur de psychologie cognitive différentielle, directeur de l'Institut Lifelong Learning and Guidance et directeur d'études du Master en médiation de l'Université du Luxembourg. Merci beaucoup. On va essayer d'avoir un petit peu de, de présentation. Alors, je suis très heureux de vous accueillir, après euh, Mylène en particulier, pour ce forum mondial de la médiation, qui a un titre très intéressant, « Regard croisé sur les médiations internationales et les médiations inter-individuelles ». Je représente l'Université du Luxembourg. Voici le logo de l'Université du Luxembourg. Et nous sommes co-organisateurs de, de ce forum et de cette conférence qui, j'en je, suis sûr, sera très intéressante pour tout le monde. Alors, l'Université du Luxembourg euh, est une jeune université. Elle a été créée en 2003, donc on est certainement une des, des universités les plus, jeunes, les plus jeunes au monde, qui est basée sur la formation et des recherches innovantes. Et... Euh, qui a essayé de faire des choses un petit peu différentes de ce qui a été fait jusqu'à présent dans les autres universités en, en Europe. Nous accueillons 6 000 étudiants, il y a 1 000 personnes qui travaillent à l'université, administratifs, professeurs, avec à peu près la moitié qui sont des enseignants-chercheurs, donc on a un ratio étudiant-enseignant qui est très important, et donc on a un suivi individuel qui est assez large. Alors, M. le maire nous a dit que Saint-Sauveur était un site pittoresque, je pense que beaucoup de monde ne connaissent pas le Luxembourg, donc j'ai mis quelques photos de notre université. C'est pittoresque, mais un petit peu différent, puisque vous voyez que nous sommes sur des friches industrielles avec des anciens hauts fourneaux qui sont autour de nous. Alors, je représente également un institut de recherche, l'Institut euh, euh, Lifelong Learning and Guidance, donc, que je dirige depuis un certain temps, s'intéresse à toutes les problématiques d'apprentissage tout au long de la vie, orientation, transition... Et en particulier, quelque chose qui est important pour nous, c'est euh, la médiation par mon, inter par mon intermédiaire pardon, et par euh, le master qui a été créé il y a déjà euh, plus de 15 ans maintenant et qui est un partenariat européen avec euh, Lyon en France et Murcia en Espagne et qui a la particularité de donner des crédits qui sont reconnus dans toutes les universités en Europe, donc des personnes qui vont faire un cursus à Luxembourg pourront continuer leurs études dans d'autres universités à travers l'Europe. On a euh, des formations sur la pratique de la médiation, mais on a aussi une petite spécificité qui est celle de former à l'ingénierie de la médiation, qui est un concept assez, assez récent, c'est-à-dire qu'on forme des personnes qui vont devenir des cadres de la médiation et qui vont développer la médiation dans les pays d'où ils viennent. Au niveau de la recherche, on s'intéresse aux dimensions psychosociales de la médiation, à la communication verbale, non-verbale, au processus cognitif de médiation. Vous avez retrouvé un peu tous ces thèmes dans les, les présentations qui sont faites et aussi sur les émotions et la régulation des émotions lors du processus de médiation. Alors, nous avons formé plusieurs centaines d'étudiants. Quand on parle du Luxembourg, on pense à la place financière. On pense également au pays qui a le PIB le plus élevé au monde. Si on continue à former autant de médiateurs, nous allons être reconnus comme le pays ayant la proportion de médiateurs la plus importante dans le monde, ce qui, à mon avis, pourrait être intéressant, surtout pour un colloque comme celui-ci. Alors nous avons une petite délégation, une dizaine de personnes, mais quand je regarde toutes les personnes qui sont ici, c'est quand même assez représentatif. Et en particulier, nous avons Madame Lydie R, qui a été médiatrice du, du Grand-Duché pendant plusieurs années et qui fera une présentation au cours de ces journées. Alors que dire de plus, à part vous souhaiter encore la bienvenue, vous remercier d'être tous présents, de vous souhaiter un bon colloque, un bon travail une bonne réflexion sur des nouvelles idées, des nouvelles pratiques, sur des nouvelles choses en rapport avec la médiation. Mais également, comme on dit euh, au Québec, je vous souhaite aussi d'avoir pendant ces trois jours beaucoup de plaisir. Merci. Merci, M. Ousman. Nous allons maintenant entendre M. Gian Piero, Turki professeur à l'Université de Padoue, en Italie, et président du Forum mondial de médiation.
Bien, c'est vrai. Je suis rouge. Ici, mais non seulement ici. J'ai découvert que le Canada est un pays du soleil, aussi comme l'Italie. C'est ça, c'est une métaphore pour la médiation. Le soleil de la médiation, le soleil du Canada et le soleil de l'Italie sont la même ou sont différents. Ça, c'est le début. Bonjour à tous, Madame et Messieurs, avec quelques-uns de vous bien retrouvés. Celle-ci, c'est la neuvième conférence internationale du Forum mondial de la médiation. C'est un privilège pour moi d'ouvrir avec vous cet événement qui était possible seulement pour le grand engagement et le grand douvement de Mylène. Merci. La collaboration fondamentale de Pascal a rendu possible la réalisation de cette occasion et de la réaliser dans ce splendide pays. Merci Mylène et merci Pascal. Et merci aussi au comité organisateur et scientifique qui ont travaillé intensément respectivement à l'organisation de tous les aspects de l'événement et l'analyse des contributions offertes. Mais je dois dire un autre merci en italien. Grazie Annalisa. Cette intervention d'allocution d'ouverture naît de 30 ans d'application de, de la médiation à différents niveaux, dont 17 ans d'appartenance au Forum et de ces 17 ans, 8 comme secrétaire général et 5 ans de président. Ensuite, au bout de ce cadre d'application de la médiation ou, de toute façon, d'exercice du rôle d'un médiateur, la question que je vais poser à l'attention de tous est la suivante. À la question Qu'est-ce que c'est la médiation Ou, c'est-à-dire, comme peut définir la médiation aujourd'hui encore, nous, méd nous médiateurs ne savons pas quoi répondre. Nous répondons que ce que la médiation fait, en la meilleure des hypothèses, autrefois, en la pire des hypothèses, nous réussissons à répondre ce que le médiateur fait. Donc, nous sommes très liés à l'expérience que avons et aux expériences que nous avons réalisées. Mais, même si dans ce splendide cadre, nous avons la possibilité d'écouter expériences réalisées dans le monde entier, la médiation continue à n'être pas globale. C'est-à-dire, elle n'a pas de reconnaissance globale et parfois non plus locale. L'expérience, en effet, ne transforme pas, je l'ai dit avec provocation, en compétence et surtout, jamais l'expérience ne se transforme en science. Nous ne réussissons pas à transférer les expériences locales sur un niveau global. En effet, à la question « Comme nous définissons la médiation ?» est à la question « Que fait le médiateur ?» nous répondons de manière différente, c'est-à-dire dans cette manière qui répond en base aux expériences que chacun de nous a réalisées. Quoi importe ça Quoi comporte ça Que nous ne devons pas penser, qu'il ne sert pas à penser que nous devons générer un écart culturel au niveau général ou des politiques publiques, donc générer un écart à l'extérieur. Au contraire, nous, comme médiateurs, qui sommes actifs dans le cadre de la médiation, nous devons produire un écart, un écart à l'intérieur, à notre intérieur, à l'intérieur de la médiation. Nous devons opérer un écart cognitif qui, dans la philosophie de la science, s'appelle un écart paradigmatique. 
Nous devons porter la médiation à une réflexion fondative en termes de valeurs scientifiques, de ce que la médiation est et ensuite de comment on la définit. De cette façon, la médiation peut être transmissible et transférable au niveau global et pas liée aux expériences locales. Autrement dit, nous devons faire la même opération de déplacement que la physique classique a fait en passant à la physique quantique. Donc, au vu de ce cadre, de cette nécessité d'opérer un écart, un écart cognitif et puis un écart paradigmatique, les questions dans lesquelles la, la, la médiation continue à se débattre et pour lesquelles nous ne savons pas répondre à la question posée au début sont des caractères fondatifs en soi se distinguent en aspect des caractères épistémologiques et méthodologiques et un aspect lié à la définition scientifique de la médiation. Sur les versants épistémologiques et méthodologiques, la question fondative a porté à la fragmentation théorique et à la génération des lignes de pensée sur la médiation, reliées à écoles de médiation que, parfois, sont même en collision parmi eux. De cette façon, ces lignes de pensée et l'école reliée ne réussissent pas à interagir parce que chacun se déplace mot ou proprio. Chacun se déplace suivant la propre ligne d'horizon. Cet aspect-là a été seulement très enrichant. Mais pendant le temps passé, maintenant ça est en train de retomber dessus. Il nous empêche d'avoir une définition partagée, unique, transférable, globale et donc scientifique. L'autre question centrale qui concerne de ne pas réussir à répondre à la question précédente est une question de domaine, c'est-à-dire où se déplace la médiation et encore où elle agit, où la médiation intervient. Depuis 30 ans de médiation, c'est possible d'individuer que nous avons deux domaines principaux. Une partie est un secteur du droit, de support du droit, donc c'est le droit qui donne un cadre à la médiation. La médiation résulte appliquée et appartenante au domaine du droit et d'affermissement de soutien au droit, pour aider le droit à résoudre ce qu'il ne réussit pas à gérer. L'autre est lié à l'individu, c'est-à-dire travailler sur et avec l'individu. Aussi, cela a porté à une limitation de la médiation, étant fait, dans ces 30 ans, plutôt qu'un développement de la médiation, on peut dire que nous sommes en train d'observer, comme il a dit Mylène aussi, une régression de la médiation. En d'autres termes, nous sommes en train de reculer et l'importance de la médiation reste dans la petitesse, dans la, sa dimension locale et pas dans la reconnaissance comme valeur totale, comme valeur générale à disposition de toute la communauté humaine et pas seulement pour ses certains parts. Ces deux domaines ont un relier important dans, information de média, dans la formation du médiateur, car elle doit se baser sur les droits sur la psychologie, sur les deux, nous ne savons pas ici quoi répondre. En effet, la collaboration avec des disciplines comme la psychologie ou les droits, plutôt que renforcer la médiation, l'ont affaibli, affaibli. On ne comprend pas précisément où commence l'une ou où les autres finissent. Maintenant, ces deux questions centrales qui concerne la médiation, c'est-à-dire la question fondative et l'aspect des domaines que nous avons dit du début, se réfléchissant sur le fait que nous oscillons, d'un côté, entre la recherche d'un accord entre les parts d'un conflit controversé, donc opération très spéciale et spécifique, ou bien 
sous respect des caractères total, trop générique comme la poursuite de la paix, de l'autre côté. Tout ça, en effet, maintient l'impossibilité de répondre à comment nous pouvons définir la médiation, donc à la question initiale, parce que l'accord est ratifié toutefois par les droits, et donc l'accord reste tout de façon dans le cadre de la juridiction du droit. Par contre, les aspects plus macro, plus génériques, c'est-à-dire liés aux aspects de la paix, sont liés de toute façon à la permanence de l'eau niveau de conflit aussi historien que nous pouvons observer. Notre contribution et reconnaissance comme médiateur, en effet, n'ont pas été résolutoires, restent impartiels et locales. Si nous entendons opérer cet écart de paradigme et ensuite celle-ci des fondations de la médiation, on doit cesser de la penser comme un instrument à disposition de quelqu'un ou de quelque chose. Mais nous devons concevoir comme une conception liée à la communauté humaine dans sa globalité. La médiation est un insulte, une manière de concevoir la communauté humaine qui voit la figure du médiateur comme un architecte des communautés humaines. Donc, comme un tisserand d'interaction qui génère et promeut la communauté. Se trouve sa colocation dans une dimension de différentes conceptions anthropologiques que la médiation peut donner à l'espèce humaine. En effet, dans l'histoire de l'espèce, nous ne sommes pas nés comme societas, comme société, mais nous sommes nés avant comme communitas, comme communauté, tant il est que les premières agrégations humaines, après la phase de la vie dans les cavernes, étaient petits villages composés par 60-80 individus et non plus dans lesquels l'attention n'était pas donnée à l'individu, mais à la cohésion du village, parce que si les villages étaient cohésifs, ils pouvaient s'occuper de tous les individus et ils pouvaient ensuite garantir non seulement la survivance de l'individu, mais aussi et surtout le développement du village même. La cohésion du village était une responsabilité partagée. La fondation scientifique, cet écart de paradigme, en utilisant une métaphore, s'est compassé d'une physique classique des objets à d'une physique quantique des interactions. Donc, cet écart doit nous apporter, après ces 30 ans, à des places, à des places le focus sur l'interaction et sur la cohésion sociale de la communauté. Ensuite, le rôle du médiateur n'est pas celui qui agit dans une domaine, soit il du droit ou verse la singularité, mais c'est un rôle qui comporte une transformation anthropologique de la conception de la communauté comme médiateur en nous considérant comme architecte des communautés. De cette manière, l'objectif de la médiation est la cohésion sociale et les déplacements de la responsabilité au niveau de tous les membres. Pour compléter cette vision, ces passages de fondation scientifique de la médiation, nous devons se déplacer et adopter, réussir à produire et à générer l'évaluation de la poursuite de la cohésion sociale. Donc, nous devons avoir des instruments de mesure qui nous mettent dans la condition de dire si l'intervention des médiations peut développer la cohésion sociale et les, et les commencements au déplacement de la responsabilité au niveau de cohésion entre les membres. En plus, nous devons adopter des instruments d'évaluation de l'impact social, c'est-à-dire réussir à démontrer scientifiquement que cette différente conception anthropologique que la médiation peut mettre en, en œuvre est dans la condition de réduire les coûts soutenus par la société 
et développer les bénéfices de la même. Donc, se déplace au niveau d'intégration, de la cohésion sociale et de la responsabilité partagée, nous permet d'opérer ce passage paradigmatique, cette opération des cas cognitifs, ainsi que des conceptions anthropologiques, et nous permet de définir enfin qu'est-ce que c'est la médiation et répondre à la question initiale. C'est une conception anthropologique de la communauté qui est différente de celle-là à qui la, socie la société nous a habitués. La société est non non quoi. Donc, parfois, elle est absente en vous l'exemple des flux migratoires, quand, par contre, la communauté est toujours certaine parce que la communauté est toujours présente et à elle et tous nous appartenons. Tout ça parce que la société est liée au domaine du droit et des reconnaissances des droits des individus, par contre, la communauté est présente aussi quand le droit n'est pas fait son apparition, quand il n'a pas encore été rédigé ou à l'égard des membres de l'espèce qui ne voient pas leurs droits reconnus, mais néanmoins, ils appartiennent à la communauté et ils peuvent donner leur contribution en termes de génération de la cohésion sociale et de partage de la responsabilité. Maintenant, après être cette partie d'analyse et de fondation, nous passons à la part des propositions. Donc, on propose que nous, nous serons tous acteurs d'une affiche de la médiation. Aujourd'hui, mercredi 17 mai, 20 17 au Canada. Une affiche qui institue un comité scientifique qui propose deux lignes stratégiques entre eux en synergie et interactive. Instituer une matrice internationale en médiation qui forme les médiateurs de demain, que ce soit un format qui puisse être adopté dans le monde entier et transfert dans l'université, mais non seulement là. Prédisposer, la seconde, une école de doctorat de recherche en médiation articulée en différents profils où la médiation soit objet d'études, d'approfondissement, fondation scientifique pour certifier la médiation, ainsi pour les, toutes les expériences que nous réalisons. En caractéristiques définies, reconnues et transférables, compris les instruments de mesure que sont efficacité et d'impact social, d'utilité pour la communauté et de valeur pour la société. Pendant ces jours de congrès, je suis disponible avec ceux parmi vous qui s'y reconnaissent dans cette affiche pour pouvoir la réaliser, pour mettre à disposition l'engagement qui chacun de nous pense d'avoir disponible. Après un temps de médiation, je pense et je propose que seulement comme ça la médiation peut avoir un avenir comme le forum même et peut devenir un cadeau anthropologique pour toutes les communautés humaines et une valeur pour la société. Merci à vous pour être ici. On marche, médiateur, un bon travail. Ça, c'est tout. Suivez les mains. Merci, M. Turki. J'inviterai maintenant les gens de la première plénière, M. Charbonneau et les différents conférenciers à prendre place à l'avant, s'il vous plaît. Avant de débuter, je demanderai à chacun des conférenciers et à la conférencière d'ouvrir la boîte qui est devant vous. S'il vous plaît, ouvrir la boîte.
nous avons pensé qu'un bâton de parole est le symbole approprié pour ouvrir une conférence sur les médiations. Le bâton de parole tire son origine de rituel amérindien. Celui qui prend le bâton a quelque chose à dire et demande l'écoute, l'attention et le respect de tous. Il ne sera pas interrompu. Le bâton en main, il n'est plus question de parler sur l'autre, mais au contraire de revenir à soi, de s'exprimer dans le registre du témoignage, une idée, un ressenti, un fait, un sentiment, une croyance. Chaque bâton qui est unique a été pers personnalisé à chacune des personnes qui le reçoit. C'est l'œuvre d'un artiste atikamek, originaire de la communauté d'Obidjouan, en Haute-Mauricie, mais qui réside maintenant à Sainte-Terre, en Abitibi, M. Alexis Wesino. J'invite maintenant M. Bruno Charbonneau à présider la première plénière. Bonjour, merci. Mesdames, Messieurs, bonjour. Bienvenue à la première euh, séance plénière. Mon nom est Bruno Charbonneau. Je suis professeur agrégé de sciences politiques à l'Université Laurentienne et directeur du Centre franco paix en résolution des conflits et mission de paix à Charaoul Landurand à l'Université du Québec à Montréal. C'est un plaisir pour moi d'être avec vous ce matin afin de vous présenter mes collègues euh, que je vais sans tarder euh, vous vous parler de leur carrière, en fait, et leur laisser la parole, euh, qui sera suivie. En fait, chacun aura 15 minutes, et on, on, ensuite, on ouvrira la séance à une série de questions. Donc, je vais suivre l'ordre du programme, si vous me permettez. D'abord, au centre, Marie-Joëlle Zahar, qui est professeure titulaire au département de sciences politiques, directrice du réseau des opérations de paix et chercheur au Centre d'études et de recherche internationale de l'Université de Montréal. De mars 2013 à août 2015, elle a été détachée auprès du département des affaires politiques aux Nations unies à titre d'experte senior sur les questions de partage de pouvoir et membre de l'équipe de réserve d'experts en médiation. Ses intérêts de recherche portent sur les guerres civiles à résolution des conflits. Elle est auteure ou co-auteure de plus de 70 publications scientifiques. Elle est titulaire d'un doctorat en sciences politiques de l'Université McGill. Madame Zahar a été professeure invitée à l'Université Lyon II et à l'Institut d'études politiques de Lyon. Elle a également été chercheure invitée au Centre pour la sécurité et la coopération internationale de l'Université Stanford aux États-Unis, ainsi qu'au Centre d'études du monde arabe à l'Université Saint-Joseph de Beyrouth au Liban. Elle a aussi été chercheure postdoctorale au Centre MOC pour les études internationales de l'Université Toronto. Anciennement consultante auprès du Bureau des Nations unies pour la coordination des affaires humanitaires, et professeure associée au Centre Pearson pour le maintien de la paix, Marie-Joëlle Zahar a siégé sur le comité directeur de l'Association canadienne de sciences politiques et sur le comité exécutif du Consortium canadien pour la sécurité humaine. Depuis 2006, elle œuvre à titre de consultante auprès de divers organismes et gouvernements dans des situations post-conflit, notamment en Irak ou au Soudan. Je sais qu'elle revient de Bamako, si je ne me trompe pas. Euh, et aujourd'hui, le titre de sa présentation est « United Nations Mediation Time for Change ». Ensuite, à ma gauche, M. William Zartman est professeur émérite, détenteur de la chaire Jacob Blaustein des organisations internationales et résolution des conflits à la School of Advanced International Studies. Il est membre du comité de pilotage du programme de processus de négociation internationale à Clickendale en Hollande. Ancien directeur des programmes de résolution des gestions d'études africaines à la SAIS, et il a été consultant auprès du département d'État des États-Unis, président de l'Institut de la légation américaine de Tangis pour les études marocaines pendant 27 ans, ancien président de la Middle East Studies Association et de l'American Institute for Maghreb Studies, membre du Conseil consultatif académique international sur l'initiative de médiation du département des affaires politiques de l'ONU, et président fondateur du Conseil d'administration de l'Institut international pour la paix et la sécurité. Il a reçu son doctorat de l'Université Yale et un doctorat honorifique de l'Université catholique de Louvain. Récipiendaire d'un prix à vie pour, de l'Association internationale pour la gestion des conflits, du Centre de l'innovation pour la gouvernance internationale à Toronto et de la section de la paix 
de euh, l'association, International Studies Association. Il est un des, des fondateurs, je dirais, par fondateur de la littérature scientifique en résolution des conflits, les auteurs et éditeurs de livres tels que Preventing Deadly Conflict, A Global Power of Talk, Negotiation and Conflict Management, International Cooperation, Engaging Extremists, Negotiating with Terrorists, et j'en passe, et j'en passe, et j'en passe. Um, <laughs> oui, parce que j'en ai pour la journée. Um, Aujourd'hui, il va nous parler d'un sujet qui me préoccupe particulièrement, « What if they won't negotiate? » Finalement, à l'extrémité de la table, M. John Packer est directeur du Centre de recherche et d'enseignement sur les droits de la personne et professeur associé à la Faculté de droit de l'Université d'Ottawa. Auparavant, il a enseigné à l'École Fletcher de droit et de diplomatie à l'Université Tufts aux États-Unis et à l'Université d'Essex au Royaume-Uni. Il a été chercheur boursier à l'Université de Cambridge et de Harvard. Il a été professeur invité dans diverses institutions professionnelles et académiques dans le monde entier. Durant sa carrière, il a occupé des fonctions intergouvernementales pendant une vingtaine d'années dans diverses instances internationales, telles l'ILO, OHCHR, UNHCR, UNDPA, OSCE. Il a été conseiller auprès d'organisations régionales intergouvernementales, de gouvernements, de communautés, d'acteurs dans plus d'une cinquantaine de pays. Le cœur de sa recherche et de sa pratique se trouve à l'intersection des droits de l'homme, incluant les droits des minorités, et de la sécurité, en particulier la prévention des conflits, la diplomatie, la médiation internationale, les accords transitionnels et les développements institutionnels au niveau local et multilatéral. Il est l'auteur de nombreuses publications, siège dans de, sur de nombreux comités éditoriaux de revues scientifiques et de revues d'organisations non gouvernementales. Il est membre du conseil, comité conseil du Shared Societies Project du Club de Madrid, qui regroupe une centaine d'anciens chefs d'État et de gouvernement de pays démocratiques. Sa présentation d'aujourd'hui s'intitule « Reflections on the Evolving Normative Framework for International Peace Mediation, Implication for Transitions ». Merci à tous. J'inviterai donc maintenant Marc Joazar à nous adresser la parole. Merci. Merci beaucoup, Bruno. Euh, ayant vu ce qui est arrivé à Mylène Jacou, je n'ose même pas me lever parce que là, je vais disparaître complètement. Euh, je, donc, je, si vous permettrez bien, je vais euh, faire ma présentation à partir de la table. Um, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Mylène, Pascal, and everyone else on the committee for making this happen. Um, as I uh, suggested, uh, I would like to reflect on UN mediation and my slightly provocative title is UN Mediation Time for Change. Um, this reflection is uh, the result of um, two and a half year experience on the UN standby team of mediation experts uh, in company. I was in very good company of uh, John and a couple others, um, during which uh, we had the privilege of observing from the front line Um, the difficulty that the UN is currently experiencing in trying to uh, resolve um, contemporary internationalized civil wars. And I want to actually maybe stop because I know the majority of people here uh, are not um, international but interpersonal mediators to say that internationalized civil wars are these conflicts like Syria, Libya, Mali, where in spite of the fact that there is an internal problem, there is also a constellation of regional and sometimes international problems that come and converge with the internal issues. In other words, for example, today, the Ukraine conflict cannot be understood as simply a problem between East and West Ukraine. It's also a problem between Russia and the EU, if not Russia and the West. Likewise, the Syria problem cannot be understood if we only focus on internal problems and the opposition between part of Syrian society and the Syrian regime. We also need to understand it in the context of uh, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, um, Turkey rivalry, as well as the context, of course, of what some people have called the return of the Cold War. So, What I'd like to do in, I think, you know, about 20 minutes or so, 
and I know Bruno is already keeping time, is to uh, talk about the core elements of mediation theory as they have been adapted and adopted by the UN. Uh, I'd like to also talk about the new elements that I see in the current landscape of conflicts, and then I'd like to bring the two together. Now, of course, um, I may burst everyone's bubble by saying that I will not be providing answers to the problem I see. However, uh, I will be, I think, proposing elements of a new research program for international mediation scholars. Uh, questions which I consider to be pressing and uh, on which there is already some work, but that need much more focused attention if we want uh, UN and more generally, you know, uh, external mediation in internationalized civil wars to have a future. So, um, so what about the core elements of mediation theory as international mediation scholars? And I'm speaking uh, under the, the shadow of one of the, the greats. Um, what does it tell us? It tells us that mediation is a process of conflict management, uh, which is related to, but distinct from, <laughs> negotiations between the parties, and where those in conflict seek or accept an offer of help and assistance from outsiders uh, to change their perceptions or their behavior without, and that I think is an interesting slight difference from the conception of interpersonal mediation, resorting to either physical force or actually invoking the authority of law. So mediation in the international realm is really separate, both from law and from violence. It sits somewhere in between to try and hammer compromises. The basic assumptions of mediation, and I would argue the ones that have been basically accepted and used in UN mediation, can be very briefly, I think, summarized as follows. First of all, the parties must be motivated to settle. Now, we'll get back to this. This probably is the thing that the UN says, but does not always necessarily uh, adapt in as much as, particularly with recent discourses in the last two decades about responsibility to protect, uh, protection of civilians, humanitarian intervention, the tendency has become to try and solve conflicts that may not be ripe for resolution. Um, second, UN mediation suggests that compromise is possible and therefore that the stakes are divisible. Even though we do acknowledge that there are indivisible stakes, there are all kinds of approaches to try and either sequence mediation in such a way as to leave the indivisible stakes until the later point in a mediation process with the hope that building sufficient trust and compromise between the parties allows us to deflate the most difficult issues or to actually uh, find a way of bracketing these and uh, finding compromises that allow some pending issues to be left for later on. Um, conflict circumstances, of course, must be ripe for resolution. The parties must, must have either hurt militarily or for any other set of reasons decided that it is time to settle and that they cannot hold any longer. And that is related to the issue of motivation. And of course, an appropriate mediator must be available. And the appropriateness of the mediator, of course, depends on a number of things. Uh, clearly, there were a lot of debates around the issue of neutrality and impartiality with recent um, agreement in the literature uh, that mediators need not be uh, neutral vis-a-vis -vis certain values such as the value of peace, but they need to continue to maintain impartiality vis-a-vis uh, -vis the various parties. Um, there are, however, uh, studies that suggest that the more directive, the more capable a mediator is of actually not just yielding, uh, wielding carrots but also sticks, uh, they are likely to be more effective than uh, other mediators, which of course raises issues for an organization's 
an organization like the United Nations, which does not necessarily have many levers of influence in as much as it depends on the often divided will of member states. And that is something that, of course, those of us who've been following UN mediations recently have seen at the Security Council where divisions among parties have actually made uh, mandates to mediators particularly either weak or impossible because they include uh, contradictory uh, uh, tasks. Now, what do we know about all of these things from mediation research? We know that it's difficult to resolve conflicts that have indivisible stakes, that zero-sum games are much more difficult to solve in a way that is sustainable and that has you know, long-term equilibria as opposed to positive sum games. And when I think about that, the one thing that comes to mind, which uh, I think everyone here will completely understand, is the difficulty, in spite of potential advances on other fronts, of resolving something like the status of the Jerusalem issue in Israeli-Palestinian relations. What do you do when a city holds holy meaning for two people and each one of them claims it as a, their own and indivisible? Um, as I will suggest later, we're having more and more of these issues pop up in current conflicts. And uh, I know that uh, Bill has been thinking a lot about that. And therefore, I will only lay out the problem, and I'm hoping that he'll give us some uh, indications of where to go um, on, uh, on this one. The second thing that we know from research, of course, is that the greater the number of actors, the more difficult any negotiation or any mediation will be. And that holds true for both, basically, um, the greater the number of actors, the thinner the common compromise that they will all be able to agree upon. Um, it is very difficult to hurt cats, to quote uh, other colleagues who've actually worked on this for very long. And uh, the risk of spoilers, i.e. of not being able to bring everyone to the table and to have excluded parties that want to undermine any settlement increases with the number of actors. Um, this, I think, uh, the people sitting at this table, because we've all been involved in one way or another in a number of uh, mediation efforts, have seen very well recently, um, particularly in the Syrian case where the attempt, the failed attempt over the past five and a half years to bring the opposition into a unified position has actually been one of the reasons why, not the only reason, I would not even necessarily claim the main reason, but one of the reasons why there has been very little progress in terms of UN mediation to settle uh, the Syria conflict. Um, Bruno just mentioned that I'm back from Mali. In Mali, we see actually um, a similar phenomenon happening with uh, the two uh, groups of armed actors who had been cobbled up during the Algiers negotiations only about a year and a half ago, already fragmenting, and one of them having already broken up into four separate parts. So the issue of the fragmentation and the multiplication of actors is a, a problem in all internationalized civil wars. Um, parties are created by interested third parties, often neighboring states, who have a stake in the issue, who are trying you know, to also play their cards in one way or the other, or simply by uh, previous attempts at mediation where uh, people realize that if you're not sitting at the table, the chances of getting something out of a peace settlement are slim, and therefore, the next time around, you take weapons and you try and impose yourself as yet an additional party that needs to be uh, taken account of. Third problem, the issue of the selection of the mediator. Um, research has already established, of course, that um, not only should the mediator be credible and be um, efficient, and it's not always the same mediator that it, 
or the same type of mediator that is credible or efficient in all wars, but that when you have multiple mediators, there's a risk of forum shopping of the parties basically trying to go to the mediator who they think is more sympathetic to their outlook in an attempt to get the best settlement. Um, now, how does this square off with recent trends in mediation? Uh, I'd like to raise three issues, and there are others, but to my mind, these three are currently the most important. The first, of course, I've alluded to, it's the fragmentation of conflict actors. Syria may be the outlier on this one. In the second year of the Syrian uh, war, the Carter Center, which has a, a daily uh, program to follow up developments on the ground, had actually uh, identified 5,000 separate armed groups in Syria. Now, these have decreased, and we now talk about, I'd say, something in the order of about four to 500. Now, some of these armed groups are only brigades, so units of 20 to 50 people uh, who are attached usually to a locality and spring more from the kind of self-defense mechanisms that you see in a place where you don't really have two pre-constituted forces in presence. But that is actually a problem in and by itself because um, while many uh, people in these conflicts, and I've seen the same in the Central African Republic, take weapons in great part to uh, provide security to their communities, they also have opinions about the shape, the general shape of the settlement they'd like to see, and they can actually have a very detrimental impact on uh, mediation efforts. In the Syria case study, uh, I think that we can very clearly point to the role of multiple groups uh, in relationship to what has been described as the um, inability of the opposition negotiators to let go of their demand that President Assad step down first before there are any kind of real mediations. And basically, to be able to maintain their legitimacy at the table, opposition representatives are often bound by very small groups when sufficient numbers of them have one demand that they hold key. Um, now, the return of ideology is, I think, the second thing that I'd like to, uh, to point to, um, particularly with uh, movements that claim some sort of religious background, such as ISIS, of course, which is uh, the most common, or Daesh, depending on um, what kind of newspapers you read. Um, the name is either uh, Daesh or ISIS, the Islamic State in Syria and Iraq. But they're not alone in basically bringing back ideological issues to the fore. Uh, and a literature which is kind of germane to what we do, the civil war literature, has recently been calling upon scholars to take the role of ideology seriously. Symbols, ideas, narratives matter. And in many ways, uh, that I think might be something where Gerald Monk's uh, approach would have something to say to international mediators. When left unattended, um, symbols, ideas, narratives, ideologies can complicate the implementation of peace agreements in at least two ways. The first is that they facilitate outbidding by extreme fringes that basically uh, withhold legitimacy from a peace agreement because they consider that their own representatives gave up on what they consider to be important issues. In Mali, something that has not been discussed at the, uh, at the negotiation table by the mediation or by anyone else, in spite of efforts by some of the parties, is the role of Islam in the public space. And that is why I say, you know, this is not just about ISIS. This is not just about terrorist groups. This is about groups whose identity includes symbols, uh, elements that are indivisible and that we don't necessarily know how to deal with from a rational perspective. And therefore, we tend to dismiss those. Yet, they're important. And today, in debates over reframing the Mali constitution, the issue of Islam in the public space is coming back to the fore. And there are no answers, either from 
previous mediators or from those mediators who are now accompanying the implementation of the peace agreement. Uh, the second thing, apart from the outbidding, is that uh, this can draw a wedge between leaders and followers. Leaders often get all kinds of perks par as part of a mediation. A compromise always involves some sort of either resource or power sharing. But the trickle-down effect from the leadership to populations or from the leadership to followers is very problematic. And therefore, this issue is far from being uh, addressed currently in ways that are uh, useful enough to give mediators leverage. The third question, uh, issue that I want to raise is the issue of the proliferation of mediators. Um, increasingly, mediation, international mediation is becoming professionalized. And in the professionalization, because it's a sexy thing to do, everyone wants to become a mediator. Canada is now looking at mediation. The Swedes have a mediation office in their foreign affairs ministry. Others follow suit. Every regional and sub-regional organization, at least on the African continent that I know best, now has a mediation support unit which is supposed to um, adopt some of what the UN mediation support unit has done. The result of which is that problems of coordination, collaboration have simply skyrocketed. Um, to give you just again a list that might be of interest, in Mali you had as mediators the UN, the African Union, the Economic Community of West African States, the European Union, the Organization of the Islamic Conference, Algeria, Niger, Chad, Mauritania, Burkina Faso. Uh, France and the US were added towards the end, and around that was a constellation of non-state mediation actors, some of which are actually quite famous internationally and get financing from our governments. Um, the Humanitarian Center for Dialogue, Pro-Mediation, Search for Common Ground, and so on and so forth. All of these people basically acting presumably, I will say presumably, towards the same objective, but not necessarily talking to one another, coordinating, or sharing information about what they were doing. Now, what does that mean for um, UN mediation? To my mind, it means a number of things. And that's why I have actually entitled the paper, Is it Time for a Change? I think that there are serious questions about whether a grand bargain is still possible in situations of such fragmentation of actors and stakes as we see currently. Can we have a peace deal that actually solves it all? Or should we start thinking seriously about how to build peace in pieces? basically starting from the bottom and building up. I think there is serious research to be done on this. There is a lot of research done on local mediation efforts, regional mediation efforts, international mediation efforts in many crises. What there isn't yet is real frameworks that look at the way in which these interact to give us guidance on how to move forward. Second, uh, to my mind, we also need, and I know that Bill Zartman, for example, has been writing about this in recent years, but we need to address ideology and ideological claims in our research, you know, um, right on. We cannot continue to pretend, as we have in the past, that uh, tricks such as politics of small steps, uh, building trust and what have you, are going to allow us to completely bracket these issues. I think that the record from, uh, you know, I'd say the past 10 years shows that these are issues that need to be taken into account. Is there a way to talk about ideology without blowing up a mediation from the start? Uh, I think there's a very interesting case, recent case that we can look at, and that's Colombia where, you know, issues of land reform which are extremely ideological for at least one of the parties, if not both, have been addressed at the very beginning of the process. Um, what does that tell us? What does the example of the Philippines dealing with the communist insurgencies tell us? That's the second kind of research program that I think we need to be pushing forward with our students. And the third and last 
Research Program is a program about something that inter interpersonal media mediators know quite well, and that is the professionalization of the field. Um, international mediation is lagging behind in comparison to interpersonal mediation. Uh, the professionalization in our field dates back about 10 years. But these attempts are catching wind. Is professionalization likely to uh, not only help us develop common practices, but also move us towards common standards that will limit the dissonance between different efforts and help harmonize efforts? Will it lead to more collaboration? I think that we have a sense of where things are going right now, not necessarily in the right direction, but to be able to really understand when it will work and, and when it will not, and to actually give policymakers some sort of uh, you know, support, we need serious research by students. And therefore, you know, uh, at least in my case, that's where I'm hoping to get my PhD students to work in the next 10 years, because in our field, I think these are burning questions and the kind of problems that we have nowadays are not likely to go away. Merci. Merci, Marie-Joëlle. Personnellement, j'ai bien hâte de lire ton livre sur tes expériences des dernières années. <rire> Donc, <rire> je cède maintenant la parole à M. Zartan. because it puts me further from the timekeeper. <coughs> Bonjour, good morning. I suis très content d'être là. Happy to be here. Uh, on me demande si je voulais parler en français or in English. Et j'ai dit ça m'est égal, but not the two at the same time. Mais malheureusement, je ne peux pas parler la langue du pays, le Canadien. I'm going to talk about, uh, going to slide into my topic about what, what to, to do if they, don't, if they won't negotiate. By talking first of all about the uh, challenges that a mediator faces. And I want to use it to wave at you a, an important little booklet that I hope everybody has. It's published by the United Nations. It's called Guidance for Effective Mediation. And although it's aimed at the international level, I think people who are working at the local level can find it an uh, inspiration in translating a bit, just as we can find inspiration from local, your type of mediation uh, in family and so on, at the international level. <clears throat> I won't be simply repeating what's in here, but I'll be drawing from some things that, uh, that this book says, perhaps even correcting a few. Uh, I think we can say that there are six challenges of, uh, that a mediator meets, mainly structural, but some of them uh, processual uh, as well. The challenges, and I'll develop each one a little more, are the challenges of the mandate, impartiality, strategy, entry, inclusivity, and leverage. Let's take the first one. Mediator uh, is sent out by somebody uh, and is very much dependent on the mandate that's given to him. That is, what are the instructions that he can is supposed to follow? What is he supposed to accomplish when he reports back home? We know pretty much that uh, at, at least in, in uh, larger scale mediations, the mediator is not the decider. The mediator puts together a package that, brings back, that he brings back to the decision maker. And there has to be some uh, coincidence between that package and the mandate that's given, the marching orders. Uh, often they're so tight that he can't move. Sometimes they're so loose that he has no guidance, and they have to be somewhere uh, in between. And they have to be flexible enough to give him some leeway for improvisation, invention, because mediation negotiation is above all a question of creativity. Uh, but there's also another side about mandate that's never emphasized very much, and that is that the mandator has a responsibility to support his mediator. I'll come back to this when we get to specifics. But the mandator engages himself, themselves, herself, whatever, uh, in uh, supporting the work of the mediator when, when the mediator goes to work to carry out the, the mandate. <clears throat> the second one is the question of impartiality. 
Now, we all know that a mediator has to be impartial. And in here, the United Nations little booklet uh, emphasizes this very much because the mediator can't be biased and can't uh, lean to one side or the other. And then it immediately contradicts itself by saying, but of course, a UN mediator is not impartial to the values that the United Nations represents, which are all over the place. Um, so uh, the question of impartiality, uh, which we uh, have a kind of knee-jerk reaction to, uh, of support agreement uh, has some problems within it. There's a lot of research, that, research that's shown recently um, that a mediator can well be biased. That is, a mediator can favor one side over the other. But there's a condition that goes with this too, just as in the first there was a condition, and that is if a mediator is biased, it's incumbent on him, it's expected of him that he deliver the side that is biased toward. If a mediator is biased and then becomes the spokesman for the side that he's biased towards, then he's docked himself out of business. So in many occasions, in many occasions, the fact that the lead mediator has a leaning to one side can be very positive in affecting an agreement between the, between the parties. Um, however, uh, there is something that's more absolute and we're still looking for a word that the mediator has to be credible uh, has to be honest, uh, has to be uh, believable uh, by the parties. And in that sense, I think one of those words, whichever one you like, is much better than the absolute of impartiality, which takes a little uh, understanding. Uh, the third of all, the mediator has to have a strategy. Uh, he just doesn't go in there and try to bring the parties together, but he must have an idea of how he's going to do this. In the international level, the first choice of strategy is between what we call conflict management and conflict resolution. That is, is does the mediator's job to stop the violence and stop it there? Or is the mediator's job to resolve the problem? First one of stopping the violence doesn't resolve the problem. The conflict management carries with it the promise of conflict resolution. If you're stopping the violence, then the parties believe, okay, we, we're not going to use be violent anymore about this conflict because we expect that we can get a, uh, a uh, result, a resolution of the conflict. Unfortunately, conflict management is an impediment to conflict resolution because conflict management stopping the violence uh, it removes all the pressure for the parties. Okay, we're not fighting anymore, so why should I hurry to give up something to the other side? Uh, and, and so uh, the, the parties are really not putting pressure on each other and the rebel, if there is one party who's a rebel against authority, rebel is giving up the only coin that he has with which to buy some kind of concessions from, from the other side. So conflict management uh, uh, promises conflict resolution but at, at the same time it removes the pressure for conflict resolution. And there are lots of cases where uh, the gap between the two has been disastrous. Conflict management agreements, therefore, tend to be, tend to be, but are not always, as in, in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, unstable uh, until we come along with, with act number two. But strategy also involves, uh, who are you gonna talk to? Whom are you gonna talk to? You're gonna talk to the chiefs, you're gonna talk to the Indians, pardon the expression here, um, are you going to talk to uh, uh, the, the friends of the parties who are competing together uh, uh, and who we, you then expect to bring the, the uh, conflicting parties together? And the, the, uh, the mediator has to have a strategy for bringing out an agreement. Another one then is the question of entry. We have to remember that in our business, a mediator is a meddler. The parties don't want us. They don't want somebody to come in and tell them what to do. And so we have to achieve some kind of agreement from the parties, some kind of entry, that we can bring a, a, a useful presence uh, into the conflict. Uh, we have to therefore achieve entry uh, into the conflict uh, in the eyes of the parties. And we do this, there's only one way to do this, if the parties see themselves locked into a conflict that, that they can't get out of by themselves, that they see themselves stalemated, 
The stalemate is not enough. We're stalemated in lots of things in life, and we go on. The stalemate must be hurting. They must be painfully locked into an impasse where they need help. Parties in conflict need help. They don't usually know it, but they need help of some kind in order to get out of it, out of it uh, in, to avoid the unending cost of conflict that, that continues. Uh, talk to any disputing couple in a mar as a marriage counselor, and you n know full well that parties need help, and they don't want you to meddle in their affairs at the same time. Another contradiction of, of mediation. So the party, the mediator has to develop this sense that the parties are locked, that they can't win, and their inability to win, inability to deliver a unilateral solution uh, makes them turn to the other party in conflict and work something out together, a multi-bilateral or multilateral solution. And all this is under the question of entry for the mediator. Another uh, challenge for the mediator is inclusivity. If you're talking to a, a marriage couple, it's probably not so much of a problem, although there may be other parties, there may be other parties who are a part of the problem. Uh, but in international negotiation, in a larger negotiation, uh, it, it, one should be able to bring everybody together. If the parties are able to make the problem, they ought to be included in making the solution, as the saying goes. But this brings up contradictions, too. Do you bring in uh, people who were uh, the, the uh, people who broke the laws, the, uh, the guys with the gun, uh, and uh, make peace among them? Uh, or do you bring in other parties who are suffering from the problem, uh, from the conflict, uh, and ask them to make peace? But uh, they're often a little bit cowed by the guys with the gun. So how do you balance the two? How do you bring in the, both the, the uh, cause of the conflict and the victims uh, of the conflict uh, in the question of inclusivity? Uh, but we say everybody must be included. Oh, but wait a minute. What about the spoilers? Because there are people who are outside who don't want an agreement. That's what we call a spoiler. spoiler. Marie-Joëlle has written a good deal about uh, the notion of spoiler. Um, it, it, you bring in the people who you know, if they come in, will destroy an agreement. Or do you keep them out, those people who you know, if they're kept out, will destroy an agreement? And the answer comes, the, the answer in concept is very easy to, to formulate often. The answer comes by the, uh, in, in the question, are they able to destroy an agreement outside or inside? Where is their weight? If they're big enough uh, to destroy an agreement uh, 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 by being excluded, exclusivity, then uh, uh, one has to bring them in in some way and buy them into the agreement. But if you can isolate them outside, so much the better. And finally, leverage. I think one, one has to recognize that the mediator has no leverage except the threat of leaving. And that takes us back to entry. The, lead, the mediator has to inculcate the notion that they need him. I talked about that before. Other than that, the mediator is powerless. Uh, he doesn't have armies. He doesn't have uh, uh, weapons. He doesn't have material aid to give to the parties. Uh, all he's got is a tongue. See my baton there? The word. Uh, he's, uh, all he has is his ability to convince the parties uh, that they need him, that he can provide something, uh, and uh, that they better talk the three of them because they could not talk the two of them together. Okay, let me jump quickly to an application of a problem that uh, Marie-Joëlle has already alluded to and that's before us all the time, and, and that is what about Syria? Syria is a very interesting case because it had two, two and uh, now three, but particularly the first two, of, of the UN's prime mediators, uh, famous people who've done good things, uh, world uh, citizens of ability, Kofi Annan, former Secretary General, Lakshar Brahimi, the Algerian who's helped solve a number of problems, not only as conflict management, but also conflict resolution, and they failed. 
And then uh, came in a much less well-known person, Stefan de Mistura, uh, whose greatest accomplishment is still being there, uh, but who has not achieved uh, enormous uh, uh, advances in the time that he has been there. Uh, Kofi Annan there for five months, uh, Brahimi there for 18 months, uh, and still they have uh, not been able to pull off the job that they were mandated to do. Let's go down the list and see how we can explain this, or is it simply that they failed, that they're getting old, or something like that? First of all, on the mandate, both of them were given charges about what to do. And when they did it and came back to the UN Security Council, they were not supported. They were not supported by the UN Security Council members, particularly two of them, Russia and China, but still by the Council in, in general in their efforts to, to bring the party. And they were not even supported in the acceptance of the agreements that they proposed uh, uh, to uh, be adopted by the parties. It took two, the UN Security Council two years to accept the, the Kofi Annan principles uh, after he had brought them back as a guideline, a blueprint for a solution in Syria. Second, uh, how about uh, uh, the question of impartiality? Well, the, the mediators had a difficult mandate here to work with. Essentially, they were saying to one side, we want you to leave. It's over. Not only can't you win, but uh, in this process, the, the other side will win in some way or other. And they, so they were, they were uh, hampered in the very unimpartiality, in the very partiality of their mandate. And that was very difficult to convince somebody like Assad, who felt that not only he didn't want to leave, he didn't have to leave, but he daren't leave because of the, uh, the job that he felt was incumbent on him. Strategy, it's an interesting topic. Who, who, who should they talk to? And both of the first two said, look, I can't get these warring groups together, as Mary Joel said. There are many, many fragments of an opposition uh, in Syria. Their problem is that they're too fragmented. The government's problem is that it's too concentrated. Uh, so I can't direct, uh, talk to them directly. It's hard to talk to their regional supporters uh, like Turkey and Iran and, and Saudi Arabia and so on. So I'll talk to the great powers because they're great powers. And so he fo both of them focused their jobs, uh, their concentration on talking to Russia and the United States. And Russia held, uh, hid behind Assad because Assad hid behind Russia and it was a nice little circular dance uh, as to not wanting to give in, and the United States uh, uh, hid behind, hung on to at least, the idea that Assad must go, which the Russians couldn't do because they were hiding behind Assad, because he was hiding behind them. You get the dance? Uh, and so uh, that approach was a strategy. The, the uh, DPA, uh, Department of Political Affairs in the UN, criticized them very much for adopting this strategy and said they should have talked to the people, but they weren't there. They were in New York. Um, so uh, the strategy was clear. De Mistura is talking more to people uh, in trying to get local ceasefires, which he thinks will spread, uh, but Russia and uh, Turkey and Iran have gone off. Yes, I can see you there anyhow. Um, <laughs> have gone on uh, to make a, some kind of an agreement that people don't follow um, all by themselves. Ripeness. And here's the big problem of the, the conflict. The situation was not ripe. There was not a, mute, a sense of a mutually hurting stalemate on both sides. As I said, Assad thought he would win, convinced himself that he would win, and convinced himself that he dare not lose. Whereas the other side uh, thought it was within too because he thought that the West would do what it did in Libya and come to their material aid, and furthermore felt that they didn't dare come to an agreement with Assad uh, because he would chew them up as he did every other time when there was an agreement with him, and because they knew they were so disunited and he was united that they felt that they would be taken to the cleaners in a talk. And so they didn't feel that they 
even if they might not be able to win, they felt too that they didn't dare lose. And so uh, the question of ripeness was absent and nobody on the outside worked on both parties uh, to make them feel that they were unable to win. That's what Brahimi said all the time to, to Assad. You know, you can't win, and I quote, you can't win, and therefore we got to come to a political agreement. And that sense of ripeness was not there. Inclusivity, uh, well, there were some major actors who were absent, uh, notably Iran. And uh, it's, I have no way of judging whether Iran would have been a spoiler in, but it was certainly a spoiler out uh, of the talks uh, until finally the agreement of, of uh, uh, Kazakhstan was made. Uh, and as I said, they too were not able to bring the warring parties uh, together. So finally, and this is something that I think we have to recognize in mediation, the leverage of the mediator was absent. He was only armed with his word, uh, and his word was not sufficient to persuade the parties that despite the support they got uh, partially, not impartially, that they were ready for a resolution. So, the question of my talk, which you thought I might ever do, get, get to, is what do we do if they won't talk? And the first answer is not much. The second answer is go back to the list in the beginning of the challenges and see where in one way or another one can meet the challenges, one can overcome these things because at least we got them specifically identified. Um, and then the third way, uh, answer, which is perhaps a little more helpful, is uh, that the first job of the mediator is to ripen. We think that the first job of the mediator is to come up with a good solution. Look, we can't, you can't, it's, it's zero sum, you can't divide it, divide it, but I have a solution, maybe we can exchange things, uh, maybe we can think of things differently. The first job of the mediator is to ripen the perception of the parties, to feel that they're stuck in a situation that they can't get out of. Sometimes it's, that's an easy job. They know they're stuck and they're, they're crying for help. But, Gesundheit. But sometimes, uh, they're, uh, most of the time, ripening is the first uh, challenge. And that means doing what Brahimi was doing and uh, Assad were do uh, and um, um, Anand were doing, that is to tell the parties, convince the parties, you can't win this. It's costing too much. You're killing too many of the people that you think you represent. Uh, and uh, it's going on and you're building a bad reputation for yourself. Um, second, a, a mediator wants to encourage the introspection of the parties. He wants to get them to think about the situation in which they find themselves. Uh, do, you, do you realize that it's costing a lot? Do you know that it's hurting? In South Africa, when the body bags came back in Namibia, and they open them up, gee whiz, do you realize that these are white people? People that you think you represent who are getting killed, maybe you better think again. Do you realize that your religion doesn't justify what you're doing? That it says you're supposed to convince, convert, convince, hold on to believers, but not kill your fellow people of your own religion. Introspection, getting into the mind of the of the conflicting parties is important. Another one is one has to acknowledge, one has to understand what makes them tick, what they are after, recognize the parties as legitimate parties. This guy may be an awful guy, but he's got a grievance. Every conflict represents a grievance of some kind. The people who hold them may be totally wrong, but they have a grievance. And we have to understand uh, what the grievance is, what the interests of the parties are. If we can't win them off by talking to them, can we buy them off in some way to get an agreement? And then one has to finally get to the thing that we all know all about, and that is offer alternatives. And I think that if I can just carry a bit further one of the points that Mary Joelle made, 
even when you have zero-sum indivisibles, one can look for ways in which there are cracks in that indivisibility. Barak said that Jerusalem is divisible. It's on the table now. And the, his successors uh, may not want to admit that, but it's on the table. One united Jerusalem is divisible. Or the second thing you can do, a media negotiator can only do three things. The second thing you can do is work out exchanges. Okay, this is indivisible, but how about another thing? Let's buy something uh, with a concession on one, with a concession on a different issue, and let's trade them off. And then third, and we don't think about this enough, although maybe you do in some of your experiences, uh, one has to think about reframing what Mary Follett called construction. If you don't look at the, if you look at the question as a conflict, that's one thing, but see if we can look at it in a different way, where it's in your interest together to come to an agreement, and you both benefit and let the conflict decide. I can give you lots of examples. Um, so uh, there are, I can't leave you without, with my first answer that there's not much you can do when the parties won't talk. Uh, there are little ways that one can work on, but to the challenges, the six challenges that I talk about uh, began with as a mediator, these little ways are even bigger stones than the big ones. Thank you. Merci, Monsieur Zachman. Monsieur Parker. Merci beaucoup, uh, Monsieur Chabineau, et uh, aux organisateurs, et surtout pour uh, ce merveilleux cadeau. Uh, je prends la parole, alors je tiens uh, la plume, le bâton. Uh, thank you especially for the fabulous uh, gift. Uh, it's my privilege to address you today, and I know that uh, we already have quite a lot of complexity that's been shared about the situations. And I'm aware that, uh, in a, some sense, we are trying in this room to uh, integrate perspectives that may be very different in terms of our professional experiences. Um, and I'm going to share my experiences uh, in uh, regard to one of the prevailing uh, issues in international uh, peace mediation which is the place and role of norms, uh, and specifically uh, what implications they hold for transition. Uh, we've already heard with regard to some, for example, uh, when I first started in this uh, field about uh, 25 years ago or more, uh, the prevailing view was that uh, neutrality was the essential standard of engagement, uh, that one could never take sides or be seen to take sides and so forth. That idea was subsequently uh, modified, if not jettisoned, uh, with, and replaced by this prevalence now of impartiality, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but also the idea of professionalization, guidance, and, and so forth, which we are uh, having more and more uh, discussion of, and, and in uh, uh, little booklets and things, which I'll talk about in a moment, which help us orientate the work that otherwise has been done in shadows if not uh, in plain secrecy, uh, a world that has not been uh, very much brought to light or to scrutiny. Let me just allow a few uh, initial uh, reflections. Uh, uh, in a film called The Quiet Diplomat, made around 2000, on the work of uh, the OSCE High Commission on National Minorities, where I used to be a director, or the director of the office, uh, Michael Ignatieff observes at one point, he says, I don't know what you do. You go behind closed doors and you come out and positions have changed and something's happened. And then he says, I don't understand what carrots and sticks you, uh, you have. Uh, this question of leverage and, and so forth. And I would say, uh, with due respect to Professor Ignatiev, he fundamentally misunderstood what we were doing. Uh, but his analytical framework was a power analysis. Carrots and sticks. How do we cause you pain or give you rewards uh, to, you know, Pavlovian conditioning of behavior. Completely misunderstood, uh, both uh, in terms of the conflicts, in terms of conflict analysis, and also the work we were doing. I'll come back to what we were doing. Um, around, actually, earlier, uh, Secretary General Boutros Ghali, in the work uh, at I, I used to do in the early 1990s, investigating uh, serious violations of human rights around the world, uh, and we brought the first UN Special Rapporteur into the Security Council in 19, summer of 1992 to address Iraq. 
And Boutrous Ghali, a professor of international law, was dead against that occurring. His position was that uh, a human rights rapporteur had no place in the uh, Security Council, that the concept of peace and security was completely distinct and separate from, uh, from uh, humanitarian uh, issues, from uh, human rights issues, and ne'er shall the, the, uh, the two meet, uh, that it was actually ultra-virus was his position uh, of Security Council views. Uh, and more, he said, those human rights constrain our ability to negotiate. We need to be free to make peace. Uh, well, we, we've learned, we've changed the position, uh, but that was the Secretary General's view. In the, the last Secretary General, and we can talk about Kofi Annan also, but uh, uh, Ban Ki-moon changed position very substantially, actually issuing Secretary General's guidance uh, to uh, special representatives and to intermediaries where the, now among uh, the rules under which uh, those uh, mediators or intermediaries function, they are, no, they are not permitted to endorse amnesties for international crimes, and we could be more specific about it. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they're not engaged with them, uh, and they might actually w literally walk out of the room when amnesties are negotiated, but they won't endorse them. So there's some kind of parameter or limit on this. I mention these because the, what they show is a kind of struggle around the relationship between norms and the role and function of the intermediary, and actually an evolution. There is an increasing preponderance of uh, guidance and, and uh, other reference points. Uh, Ban Ki-moon, of course, was speaking in a post-9-11, post-Rome statute world, international individual responsibility. Questions had already arisen around, but, around Kofi Annan's personal individual responsibility in Rwanda, for example, which changed his specific positions subsequent to that. So norms suddenly came with great power to affect these persons, not to mention the very norms under which their standing existed, such as their own privileges and immunities as United Nations representatives, for example. Um, slide. We've already heard that uh, there are a little booklet that uh, Professor Zartman held up to you. Uh, uh, I'd like to just draw your attention. That was 2012. That's only five years ago, actually, about four and a half years ago. Uh, and before that, there was no formal guidance, no formal guidance to international mediators or intermediaries, not from the United Nations at least. They, they were appointed through highly political, uh, very uh, dubious uh, uh, closed door. Uh, horse trading between politicians and diplomats, persons who have no experience whatsoever uh, in the role and no context. And I'll mention one from our own uh, country, Joe Clark, who after he was defeated as prime minister, uh, was uh, subsequently named as the Commonwealth's uh, uh, intermediary in Cyprus. Why do you think Mr. Clark had particular experience in Cyprus or spoke uh, Turkish or Greek or at anything? No, not at all. I don't think uh, Mr. Clark had pretty much been much outside of Canada other than formal foreign ministry. But Canada was a major contributor of troops. You had a traditional piece, a, a divided line, the green line. It was a role. And, and then it was, good luck, Mr. Clark. That was the guidance. Good luck. Uh, do your best. So we've come a long way. But these guidances, and I mentioned uh, a few of them. You'll see uh, the most recent one. Uh, uh, 2017 Guidance on Gender Inclusive Mediation Strategies. These are all available online, translated in many languages. I've had the privilege of contributing to their elaboration. What I want to mention is that this is very recent. And it's a kind of experiment in trying to resolve this uh, dissonance between the norms that exist, the many, many norms that exist and standards, and the actual work that's uh, being done. And some of them don't make sense. In the little book on the guidance of effective mediation, what we heard from Professor Zartman is that one of the guidance requirements, something I believe you would function under normally, is the consent of the parties. That's just plain false at the international level. The parties do not consent. They are often uh, actively antipathetic to the initiative. They don't like the internationalization of the pro. They don't want anyone sticking their nose in their affairs, particularly outsiders who are preponderantly ignorant of the local conditions and so forth and so on. So we're struggling with this uh, evolution of guidance. I'm nonetheless in favor of it. I'm in favor of it because heretofore we have been highly unprofessional, if not plain ignorant, about the work that has been done, and that would 
uh, that would underline or explain why the majority of peace agreements negotiated and concluded in the last many years fail to be sustained uh, within five years. There's a recurrence. So we're not resolving much, and we're not necessarily even achieving uh, what Johann Galten calls negative peace, uh, the uh, uh, ending of violence. Let's uh, take a quick look at what I mean when I talk about norms. So broadly speaking, uh, and, and we have to speak broadly, because at the international level, uh, unlike the, the general work you would be uh, performing, we are not functioning in a robust legal framework. It's not like there's a rule of law on all of this. As Mary uh, Joel mentioned, we're operating somewhere between law and chaos, I would say. Uh, and, uh, and in that context, you can't say, oh, well, you know, there's a court we'll ultimately go to, or there's going to be a sergeant at arms who comes in. None of that. Not only do intermediaries come unequipped in terms of levers, we don't come with billions of dollars, even if we have good connections with the World Bank or whatever. We don't actually have those instruments, but we don't have a basic rule of law. So this is highly, highly problematical. So norms as such are nonetheless present and very important. There are norms of many kinds operating right now in this room. I'm appreciative that you are respecting one of the norms, which is to be polite and to listen to us. Uh, but there are legal norms, there are cultural norms, so we'll talk about some of them. But what do I mean? I mean standards of good or proper behavior forming the basis of some expectations. How do we uh, live with a kind of trajectory about the future? What follows from statements and conduct? Um, and, and amongst members of communities, in international peace mediation, we are not talking about two individuals in a private dispute. Uh, we're not talking, by the way, here about commercial uh, mediation or arbitration. So what are they? There are things about you know, the way we do things around here, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, what ought to be. And there are a lot of those norms which are relevant. I'll give you quickly uh, a list of them, but first of all, let me just state that norms are not, uh, are not imagined uh, entirely. They are also facts. They are part of our social condition. They define our civilization. In fact, we often uh, refer to them as achievements. Humans are moral beings in this regard. Uh, and there is, in this respect, no norm-free, never mind neutral, norm-free place that just doesn't ex exist. Uh, so there is, there is, in this respect, uh, respect, immorality and morality, but not a morality with respect to these uh, matters. It's a matter of human consciousness, the way we interact, and so forth. Responsibility, the ability to respond, but also the moral integrity of responding, is dependent upon those norms. What are those norms? And our ability to order, predict, and plan our lives is norm dependent. In this respect, we would speak about things like compliance or conformity uh, or even performance. Largely, we will talk about respect. Uh, and of course, the contrary of that is breach. So a quick typology, if you allow. I won't go through them, but just to say, there are uh, not only all sorts of uh, sources of norms, kinds of norms, social, cultural, religious, legal. That's not a hierarchy. Religious norms may be way more powerful than legal norms, for example. And there are lo lots of cases we could talk about. Jehovah Witnesses problems about, for example, uh, blood uh, transfusions at uh, risk of death, where they pit exactly a religious or uh, uh, norm against a, a legal norm, or standard, in fact. Uh, there are uh, standards or patterns uh, of norms. There are ideals, what we imagine. There are those which are instrumental with regard to conduct versus those which are constitutive of status, what norms give us standing versus what we should do. And, and then there are all the variations. I just list them, the prescriptions versus the proscriptions, express, implied, and we can go through them. Um, uh, I want to draw in particular your attention to this thickness and thinness because in many international contexts and particularly civil war contexts, you know, I think it's, um, is it trans, I'm not sure who produces the world's index on fragility, maybe my colleagues know, uh, but I think now something like 75 out of the 200 states in the world are either fragile, failed, or failing. So we're dealing in an area where there's a relatively thin systems of normative robustness, if I can say, uh, and at the international level, including in terms of regional organizations or the geopolitical context, we also have enormous variation. For example, the, norm, the normative framework in Southeast Asia 
or East Asia is much thinner than the normative framework in Europe, where you have the European Union, the Council of Europe, the OSCE, and many others. Okay, so what are uh, the relative uh, importance or the relevance of, international, of norms for international peace mediation? Because remember, not long ago, the position was norms don't matter. In fact, they constrain our ability to negotiate. And by the way, it's all supposed to be neutral. So first of all, we now know that existing norms uh, and consequences are keys to accurate conflict analysis. We can't even understand the conflict in the absence of norms. How do we understand what's the validity or legitimacy of parties and so forth? What's our reference point in this? You know, some, there are those uh, independent scholars, uh, one uh, at Harvard that I, I used to uh, work with, who, uh, yeah, I say I used to work with, <laughs> who uh, actually wrote about, you know, uh, uh, a kind of a neutral analysis of conflict uh, called the water's edge theory, which was we shouldn't ever engage, we should just let the conflict burn itself out. Well, think about that for a moment. So what does that mean? That means the biggest, most powerful, most uh, irresponsible will simply defeat. What does defeat mean? It means to c kill, maim, uh, and otherwise wreak havoc, and that would be the better outcome. We don't intervene, we don't uh, for various reasons. How do we understand the conflict? For example, victim versus perpetrator. What's, what's our analysis based on? At a minimum, we will have normative dissonance because most conflicts, as Professor Zartman has reminded us, are fundamentally grounded in grievances. Whether they're legitimate, whether they're even true, they are held. And those grievances often include disputes over norms themselves. What is the, a civil war? What's the rule of law? In the case of ISIS now, world views substantially uh, uh, conflicting, and even the notion of justice within periods of our life or the next life and so forth. So this is, this is a, 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 an immediate thing. We cannot overlook the norms uh, for the first uh, activity of an international mediator, which is to analyze the conflict. Norms also help us frame understandings, the relations we have between different parties, visions they may have and we may have, and they condition and shape our own conduct, what's moral, what's immoral. And norms, of course, are dynamic, they, they evolve. So uh, that's just giving a sense, uh, again, of what we're talking about here. But I want to also draw your attention to norms as tools. So norms are not just ways of, anal of analyzing, but they are also ways in which we can engage. Norms offer ways of behaving. behaving. Yes, Putras Gali, they constrain. And it's a damn good thing. So we need to understand that we are functioning within normative frameworks, and those norms constrain bad behavior and hopefully facilitate good behavior. They offer or, uh, ideas of order, predictability, that we, for example, procedural norms. Shall we meet again? Do we respect that? Do we not respect that? It's very simple but it's fundamental. And at all levels, these norms are operating, at the micro, meta, and macro levels. They manifest our notions of what's just, of what constitutes virtue. They are counter actions to chaos, uncertainty, and vulnerability. And for that reason, norms resonate, because the human experience on a universal level at some point intersects with norms. It's one of the reasons that the kind of almost stupid initial uh, a basis of many meetings between intermediaries and others is to talk about family, talk about the weather, because these are universal, resonant uh, notions. And we can talk about a good day versus a bad day, uh, the health of your family versus the challenges of ill health and so forth. Uh, so life is valued. With regard to international mediation, uh, I want to also underline that norms uh, not only are tools in framing, uh, and uh, in terms of analysis, but they are also fundamentally uh, uh, useful in terms of the, uh, the uh, mediator or the intermediary as an interpreter, as a translator of norms. What, uh, what one uh, professor, uh, Stephen, uh, um, uh, uh, now I forgot his name, but a professor at the University of Michigan uh, has uh, called a normative intermediary, the, the, where, the, uh, where the mediator is actually, Stephen Ratner is his name, uh, where the mediator is actually interpreting these norms for the parties in terms of specific applications, implications, and therefore guidance for conduct. Um, 
they, he, they may require some, uh, some negotiation on the norms themselves. Uh, they uh, often are uh, in context of contested norms or overlapping norms. One of the uh, emerging uh, discussions in, the, in, in international law is uh, around the notion of plural legalism or plural juridicalism, where we, and in this country, in Canada, we have this very much, of uh, many uh, legal norms overlapping. Um, norms, uh, uh, the mediator can also use them uh, in terms of their elasticity, the way in which a norm uh, may be articulated in specific standards, uh, in ways in which they may be shaped uh, from the general to the specific. And they may be nuanced in that regard. So this uh, um, contributes to normative evolution itself. Uh, for example, in legal terms through jurisprudence, they offer opportunities to frame in the sense of problem solving. Uh, and ultimately what we are encouraging here in terms of persuasion of parties is that that norm is, is uh, already digested and therefore uh, it gives rise to voluntary compliance or conformity. We're actually relying upon the parties to, uh, to live by the norms. It's a core of sustainable uh, peace. Um, I don't have time uh, to talk about, I was going to talk about uh, a very specific experience, the OSCE High Commission on National Minorities, uh, which is an institution of the OSCE and was created at the end of the Cold War to manage the transitions from communist uh, uh, Central Eastern Europe, former Soviet Union, to democratic, uh, peaceful democratic states, uh, where I had the privilege of helping establish that institution and working as its uh, legal advisor and director for uh, nine years. Uh, I won't go through it, and I'm happy to share my, my, uh, my presentation electronically um, and invite you to look at it. Um, but uh, essentially what the High Commission on National Minorities did with the mandate to prevent pe uh, violence and to contribute to a sustainable peace and development the High Commissioner essentially did the things that Professor Zartman talked about. He was, uh, or, or later she, uh, an active ripener. Because the position used to be, um, and Professor Zartman could correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the other prevailing um, uh, problems of international peace mediation was that nothing could be done in the absence of a ripe conflict. And that was, first of all, not pursuant to the mandate. Mandates actually, some mandates actually said, nonetheless, you must engage. But second of all, there is much that can be done. And the idea of a passive intermediary who just brings carrots and sticks and so on uh, was actually not, uh, not the real uh, experience. The High Commission on National Minorities, as a, uh, as a standing institution of international relations in the European context, actively contributed to the ripening and the actual solutions, contribution to solutions of sustainable peace uh, and development across Europe, for example, through negotiated treaties, constitutional arrangements, and so forth. So I won't go through all of them, uh, but uh, let me conclude by saying that uh, in this regard, uh, the, if we understand the international uh, mediation, uh, peace mediation, and the intermediary or mediator as a kind of handmaiden uh, moving between, uh, if we talk about transitions, moving from chaos or risk of chaos or organized violence in terms of civil war, and less and less it's organized, it's increasingly disorganized chaotic violence, but the intermediary's role is to actually serve as a kind of uh, a conduit to transform, to use the words of, of, uh, of another scholar in the field, the situation from one of chaos and violence into one of sustainable peace and development in the positive construction of that notion, which is to say a resilient, self-managing society. And that function in transition means that the intermediary must be conscious of and professionally competent at uh, activities relating to, for example, better governance, uh, uh, economic and social uh, arrangements, uh, 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 humanitarian uh, engagement and a whole host of other skills and uh, areas of work that are not traditionally part of the equipment, particularly of the diplomats who have heretofore uh, been the principal intermediaries. I'd be delighted to talk about this in more detail over coffee or at another opportunity. Thank you for your attention. Mais je vous remercie beaucoup. Je vous invite à me jo euh, vous joindre à moi pour remercier nos excellents panélistes. Merci.